The Insider's Guide to Energy podcast is proud to announce the Data Science mini-series in collaboration with Forbes, problem-focused and solution-driven. On this show, we will be covering everything from data science fundamentals to trading, forecasting, working with large data sets, and even skills required. Make sure to follow us on Spotify or Apple Podcasts so you don't miss out on new episodes. Welcome to Insider's Guide to Energy Data Science Mini-Series. We're doing this series myself, Chris Sass, and Selena. Welcome to the program, as always. Hi, Chris. Thank you. I am really excited to be focused solely on data science and how it's used in energy. Uh, You and I talked, it's been a year, I think, in the works that the two of us have talked about bringing this out. Your customer base is uh, using data science to solve energy problems. I'm seeing it in the industry. Um, What do you want to achieve in this series? Well, I want to explore how data science is changing the industry right now. I mean, data science has been around for a while, but we've seen changes, uh, especially coming in uh, with renewables in the last years that have been remarkable. And I'm really looking forward to interview our guests on very different topics to talk about how data science is impacting their work. So you mentioned that renewables is changing data science's dependency or the industry's dependency on data science and the need for it. Um, I mean, I, I see it across the board. I think all industry is, is leaning into data science these days. So I don't absolutely think it's unique, unique to energy. But what, what I am looking forward to in, in the episodes that you and I've recorded is going through many of the use cases that we saw across the industry, right? That, that to me, is where the transformation is taking place right before our eyes. Yes, absolutely. And it's not only companies that that have been around for a while, there are also new business models solely uh, working with uh, large amounts of data, technology-driven innovations, which is very interesting to me. So at the end of listening to this data mini-series, data science mini-series, what do you think our audience is going to get out of it? If, If you sit through and listen to all the episodes that you and I have created, what is an audience member expecting to understand? I think the audience will have a broad overview of what is possible right now, what is going on, the current trends that are that are happening. Um, but we're also going deep into into the technique sometimes in some episodes and talking about models and and t- technology. So in order to do this, we brought a guest along today. So I'm going to let you introduce our guest, and then maybe it starts to we should start with the fundamentals: is what is data science and what is some of the nomenclature before we get there. So why don't you start by introducing Eric to the show? Yeah, great. So we have Eric Sobolewski from TLGD today with us. He's a consultant and he's a data science expert. And let's hear from him what all those buzzwords that we've been talking about mean to him and what, how he would define them. Hi, Chris. Hi, Selena. He said data science, you said data analytics, you said machine learning. And the thing is, like, one problem in our area is there's so many buzzwords and they move at light speed. <laughs> it's sometimes really hard to, to uh, keep an overview. But I'll try it really brief. So I would say data analytics is more like a concept. It's something, it's the basis of everything. It's the, the, the structured approach, systematically analyzing data with the means of computation, I would say. Um, data science and machine learning, it's kind of funny because they are very often used interchangeably. And uh, but it's a pretty good joke that usually riles up data scientists a lot. Um, it's basically, you, you say, uh, if it's written in Python, the coding language, uh, it's machine learning. If it's written in PowerPoint, it's data science. <laughs> you get a good response from that. Oh, yeah, you, you definitely, it, the room becomes very lively very quickly. But the thing is, um, it, it, <laughs> there's a kernel of truth in it. The difference is basically that data science is more focused on, I would say, like analytical use cases that are um, aimed for decision support. So the idea is really that you... But they also use like very complicated mathematical methods. So it's, it's and they also use code. <laughs> so it's not like that they don't code, but it's aimed towards something else. It's aimed towards steering a company better, I would say. And that's why often it ends up in PowerPoint presentation, because this is how you talk to management. So. And so when, when we heard about that, how does then, because you said buzzwords, I mean, the next buzzword is machine learning, AI. Yes. Um, how is this interconnected with, with data science, data analytics? Is it, from your perspective, how would you say that? Yeah, the funny thing is, I mean, it all uh, has to do with, uh, I guess we have to, the easiest would be to look at what big data actually needs. Um, 
<clears throat> there's a something that there's a bit of a joke that goes around in the community. It goes like if you want to say AI, you have to say BI first. So AI obviously is artificial intelligence and BI stands for business intelligence. And the idea is that you collect data at scale that helps you, that informs you on your business, so to say. And the thing is, machine learning is only enabled by big data. You need a lot of data and you need it very well structured and high performance systems. And I guess the connection is that without big data, you can't really have machine learning at scale. And big data has been around for about 20 years. It basically is connected to cloud computing and the decrease in cost. And when Google and AWS and whatnot started um, renting out their, their capacities that they didn't need anymore, um, yeah, basically when the cost dropped for computation and storage, this is when for the first time you were able to process data at scale cheaply. Eric, I, I think what you're saying is really leading up to the perfect storm of what's happening in the market, right? And what's happening in the energy industry, because we needed the fundamentals. You, you talked about big data in your answer. You, you talked about the enablers. And, and what's driving the change, from my opinion, um, really is, you know, that we have cheap compute, we have cheap storage, we have the ability to do that, and we have pressure on the industry to lower costs. The industry is maturing, so we have to get, you know, cost structures down. And as Selena, as you said in the opening, you, you talked about renewables and, and the pressure they're doing. So, so maybe it makes sense. Why are renewables driving this data drive? Why, why is that happening? How is that part of the perfect storm, as I'm, I'm alluding to? Well, I think renewables change the game, for example, when you look at trading, because there's so much more um, to, to forecast now coming in with renewables, because you can't plan ahead that much um, with, a, with renewables um, compared to, uh, to, to a conventional power plan. So forecasting is reliant on, on data. Uh, the trading changes dramatically because you have to be able to, to trade shorter um, horizons of the time time horizons shorter periods um, of energy and all that is only possible with automation and this is also relying on data so automation data all the things that we need you, you talked about shorter horizons of time or settlement periods that, that need to take place and as the other trends like distributed energy which i consider from renewables we have a lot more sensors a lot more you know if i have to balance the grid in real time there's a lot of things that are happening that are probably going to happen faster than the pace that humans can digest and, and, and use the information. So I think data science is helping on that side of the business. Other trends that I've seen are things like predictive maintenance. Go back to lowering your costs. Um, that, that one, you know, we've got an episode that, that we recorded where, where they were using data science to help reduce cost of operational um, sides of the business. What about, what are you seeing, and Selena, your day job, you work a lot with traders. What are you seeing on the trading side? Are, are, how are traders using data science to improve their, their business there? One part is, as I already said, the forecasting. So we also have an episode um, where we talk about weather because, of course, renewables dependent on the weather. And it's very important to be able to forecast better what you can be trading or what you, yeah, what you be trading in, in the next couple of, of yeah, hours or days. And this is where data science and machine learning come in and is very helpful. And then, Eric, what do you see? How are the companies using the data that you're seeing? I would say energy companies, they don't produce data for the sake of producing data, but they produce energy, right? For sure. And that's exactly the same thing. The question is basically, you have to ask yourself how you want to use data to fuel your production process. Because ultimately, you can always do two things with it. You can use it to steer yourself better, get clues on how you're doing. But for that, you need to understand what your goals are and how to measure them. And the other part is you can make money with it. And then we're back to your point from earlier, Chris. If you have information that might be useful for somebody else, like, I don't know, um, Mercedes-Benz is an example. They actually advertise a use case where you can get information on the capacity of grids. So they tell you from their charging points and stations, the information that they have on charging, they'll tell you what a grid is capable of in a certain area. This is data that is produced as a byproduct, but a useful value. So I would say, if you ask me in the industry in general, from what I'm seeing is I'm seeing a lot of buzz about it. I'm seeing a lot of activity. To me, it doesn't look like it's um, it's it doesn't look like it's leveraged to scale at the highest level yet. This is what it seems like to me. And are we headed that way? Do you do you see 
see the trend that people are doubling down on their data strategies and then making the investment and then getting the right skill sets in house or hiring the right companies to help them? That's an interesting question. The thing is, in the last couple of years, many, many companies have invested a lot. They've invested in technology, they've invested in people, they've invested in processes and so on. And I think that many companies are still kind of looking for the value from all that big investment. So interestingly, right now we're at a point where I, um, I have the feeling that many, many projects have to deliver first before we can actually see how is what road it's going to be taken next. And besides delivering, I, I kind of wonder, you know, what the expectations that companies have, right? For me, data science isn't really magic. Right? It, it, it's really about coming in and understanding what you can get. Um, Selena, what, what kind of expectations should people expect? Like, what can they get from the data? What can we do, right? Because I, I've experienced, you know, I'll go to a senior leader and talk about data science, and they think you're, sp you're sprinkling pixies over something, and suddenly you out come with some amazing information that they can't do. H how's the process work managing those expectations? Yeah, it's very important to say data science is not magic, because sometimes the expectations is very high, hoping that um, using data science or using machine learning will change everything or help with all the challenges that the company has been facing. Um, the most important thing, I think, is to understand that uh, the, the groundwork or the foundation for data science is to, to see what's there, to know what data do I have, how is it structured, how reliable is it. So data governance and data assurance, data quality is very important. And that's the homework every company has to make. And I, I feel that sometimes it's a journey that starts right there and you can't jump in and say, okay, I'm going to be uh, data driven from, from tomorrow on. And, and Eric, I guess maturity levels, I mean, what do we need to know there? It reminds me very much of a topographical map, actually. Uh, when you look at companies, usually the data maturity is never its never a straight line, obviously. It's very heterogeneous. It really depends. This, in bigger companies, you have areas that are excellent at using data's, uh, data and other areas that are still at the beginning. So it really depends. I could also imagine that uh, if, uh, if it's a big company, departments go about differently when it comes to data. So you have maybe a big company, you have the trading desks and, and they're very, yeah, very developed and have great technology. And then you might have other uh, uh, yeah, departments in the company that, that are not that uh, yeah, far along in the, on, the, on the maturity. Yeah. So um, maybe if you can shed some, some light on this too. Yeah, I mean, banks are usually good examples or I think like I've, I've heard of one or two. Um, where it's kind of interesting um, when you think about the investment banking um, departments, usually they're very, they're obviously tapped into data because they have to, and they're very fast. This all happens in real time in data. Real time usually means um, the latency is below 100 milliseconds. So this is like basically faster than this. <laughs> and, um, so yeah, there it makes all the sense and they're very much tapped into this, but there's also other parts of uh, like a bigger bank. Of course, it has to be a bigger one. And it really makes sense. Um, but um, yeah, there might be parts in there, I would say that core production process or in their core services where you might not be that far along. That's interesting, Eric, that you say that because it's the same thing that I also experienced that within a company, there can be different threats, different maturity levels um, on the journey to, to data driven, to be a data driven company. Um, also, data governance always is uh, something that is. <laughs> being organized very differently within a company. And I think one of the interesting questions that uh, you and I, Chris, also have talked about a lot is uh, how much data do you need? How much data is enough? How much data do you want to keep? Eric, is, uh, can you shed some light on that too? Yeah, the thing is like uh, many people are under the impression that data itself holds value. And that is usually not true. Because if data is not collected for a particular purpose with a use case in mind, it's a byproduct of your production process. Interestingly, when you save a lot, a lot, a lot of it, and big companies have a lot, a lot, a lot of it, it's not going to be that cheap anymore. And the second thing is it becomes unmanageable. Um, the issue is basically um, you really want to think about what data you collect. And ideally, you think about that by looking at your value chain. What trends have you seen? You mentioned earlier in our conversation that Data science isn't new. We've known about it a long time. 
Uh, I think you alluded to the fact cloud computing and resource has opened it up and, and, and made it perhaps more available at scale. But what, what enabling technologies or what enablers are allowing things to go on today in you know, going into 2023 here at the end of this year, as opposed to even just a few years ago, what, what, what transformation is taking place other than the fact of cloud computing? So <clears throat> the newest thing really that you will find on any data conference at the moment is called Data Mesh. And it draws its inspiration from a thing called domain-driven design. It comes from software engineering, and the idea is that you build around, uh, you could say, topical entities in a company. There might be a sales domain, it might be a customer domain, it might be a, an engineering domain, logistics, what have you, or finance. And the idea is that you actually, instead of having like, one big so-called monolith to rule them all from a software side, you build small modular setups, like with con logical containers that can produce certain steps of logic. And uh, there's, a, um, there's a brilliant data specialist called Zamak Dagani that asked, why don't we apply the same thing to data? Because one of the most important paradigms in data right now is still that you actually move data out of all the primary sources, sales, finance, logistics, what have you, move them into one or several centralized entities, usually built around a central data team that then processes it and then sends it back to the data users. And the question is really, if we work decentralized in other parts of the company, why should we apply the same thing to data? That is currently debated. That is currently uh, like Netflix is trying to implement it right now, or at least to build something similar as far as I'm concerned, or as far as I know. But um, yeah, the question is really, can this be done? I personally think it's a brilliant idea. The only thing I see with it is that your data maturity needs to be really high and you shouldn't have like thinking about the topographical map again. If you have a few peaks and the rest is rather low, it's gonna be kind of quite complicated to implement this. You need to raise the levels first. Throughout all the organization because um, yeah, so you don't have those different levels, um, I would imagine. Or less, not these steep differences. This is never going to yeah. be a, a flat plane, so to say. But at least, like you try to, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We all, we all hear the bus, and I mean, um, we all know the pain of trying to to fit data into one centralized data. Uh, um, yeah, if it's a lake or somehow base or anything. Um, well, lake, uh, lake house. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, okay. put in your your buzzword here exactly. Um, so it would be so nice to 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 get rid of this and uh, and have the yeah, domain specific um, features that you want to have um, for 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 data. Interestingly, but, it's not a new concept though, because the thing is like when you usually when you build data functions, you start with a central team usually, also a central infrastructure. Once this works, you actually branch out. One of the principles is that you put analysts in departments, but they get the data from one central system, and then. As you get more complex and your maturity rises, um, what you can do is you actually uh, put small data warehouses, small like data infrastructures, so to say, in units and hire the, you call it, the right personnel to maintain it. So this is also a way to branch off. Yeah, for me, just the, the word data governance rings in my head right now. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, the, the, the big challenge in any, compa in any company to, to maintain uh, yeah, there's a standards on your data. Um, yeah. What, yeah. what do you know about uh, best practices or the developments in the last years when it comes to, to data governance, uh, data quality, data assurance? Yeah, interestingly, that we're back to the very beginning of our talk. Does it make sense to store all the data? In data governance, it gets really complicated. The problem is a lot of data is hard to handle because you need to keep tabs on it, and that's going to be very annoying. And on top of that, it might even be, depending on your industry, it might be highly regulated or even security relevant, like energy, right? And uh, you need to safeguard that data because it might potentially give away things that shouldn't be given away. Eric, I, I totally agree. I was, I was in a meeting with one of the large energy traders here in Europe the other day, and, and they had a unique data governance policy that all their partners and vendors, so I happen to be a vendor at that meeting, um, can't keep any of their data at all. And including emails, including texts, anything at all about their trading operations. We were doing some work with their traders. And, and so it's very interesting, the range that I'm seeing of data governance, right? So from a vendor point of view, offering services, 
you need to offer governance that meets every organization's needs. I don't know, Selena, are you seeing similar things? Because that, that one took me back. I mean, I, I, I worked with hundreds of energy companies and I've never had one saying, I can't even keep a text or a simple email from them for more than 24 hours, I think was their policy. It was a very, very restrictive policy. Um, I think that's been changing in the last um, months or, or f a few years, I think. Companies are becoming more and more sensitive when it comes to security and when it comes to to keeping their data from 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 other eyes. So this has been something that we've been talking with our clients um, more and more about that um, they are very restrictive when it comes to their data and how this data can be used for from from, from outside. And what about open or public data? There, you know, I, I worked with the wind industry and solar industry. I think I hosted a, a wind panel a couple months ago, and there was a big push from the data scientists on the call to have open data, right? And, and I understand in trading and, and proprietary parts of the business, are you seeing trends of bits of pieces of information that the companies are willing to be open that are easier to access so that they can get third party or, or neutral data, or is it all really proprietary in your experience these days? I think that's the discussion. That's a discussion that's been that's that's going on right now because of course nobody wants to to share the data that they're that is critical to their business. But there is of course advantage to sharing data, to sharing weather forecasts when it comes to forecasting renewables. And um, there are different organizations and also different modeling approaches that uh, should be able to use data across different companies, across different organizations without really showing them, without being uh, yeah, too open about it. But that's a trend that has been starting and yeah, making making more use out of the data without sharing too much. I think it's a bit of a uh, yeah, difficult dilemma. So governance got us into this trend conversation as we get towards the end of this episode and in, in the beginning of this mini series, wh where do we go from here? What, what, what else do you think is important for our audience to, to know? I mean, we, I think we've talked about some of the use cases. You're going to see them come out in the episodes that we bring out. Uh, we talked a little bit about the technology that, that's required. Right? We talked about cloud and things like that. Are you seeing any trends there that are going to drive the conversation of, of new and emerging technology or just off-the-shelf technology that is empowering people that aren't data scientists to do more? What, what are you seeing there? Flexibility is a word that comes into my mind first because when you think about different cloud providers, um, companies don't want to be too dependent on one. They want to be able to be changing fast if they think it's 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 good for them. So to build systems and to build infrastructure for your data modeling, for your data doing that's flexible enough to not be dependent on, on, on different providers or vendors, I think that's a very interesting challenge that organize, organizations face. Yeah, and I think you get back to Eric, what you said earlier, you know, we talked about the, the organizations, the cloud services, the hyperscaler type of things. I mean, you didn't mention that by name, but I mean, that's kind of implying that. Um, I think containerized solutions already being in place make it easier for organizations just to drop in solutions. That That's what we're seeing. I, I think our audience, you'll hear that throughout the episode. Um, I'm looking forward to going on to the next episodes and sharing more with you in the weeks to come. Selena, any final thoughts as we close this episode today? I'm excited to the different approaches that we've been talking about in the last recordings with our guests. And I'm very looking forward to, to the release of our mini series. And Eric, thank you so much for being our guest and helping us kick off this mini series. It's been a pleasure having you with us today. Thank you thank so you. much for having me. <laughs> thank you for laying the groundwork. <laughs> Glad if I could help. <laughs> and we look forward to you, our audience, following the entire series. Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to share it with your friends. Lots of great content to come. We'll see you again next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.